everyone. Are you facing a tough challenge right now? Maybe something that feels impossible? Is there an obstacle in your life that appears immovable or impenetrable? Is something stopping you from moving forward? We all face challenges in life, which at times we think, I just can't do it. I can't manage. When the Israelites had come out of slavery in Egypt and after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they finally cross over into the promised land. And what's the very first thing they're faced with? The impenetrable city of Jericho. Right there, in their way, stopping them from moving forward. Jericho had been built as a city around the year 8000 BC. The city was 40,000 square meters in size and had around it the oldest known protective wall in the world. Actually, the city probably had a double wall of protection as archeological excavations show that a second protective wall had been built in the Bronze Age. And the walls were at least 13 feet high, six feet wide and had watchtowers of 28 feet in height. And after all these Israelites had been through, they now faced this fortress that appeared impossible to take. They must have been so despondent. We all face Jerichos in our life. I wonder, what is your Jericho right now? That which seems impossible to succumb. Is it a work-related Jericho? something in your business that seems impossible to get through? Is it a relationship Jericho, a financial Jericho? Or maybe yours is a health Jericho, a, a healing you're longing for that just seems impossible. What are we to do in these moments? You might know the story how the Israelites embark on an unusual strategy given to them by God and with the Lord's guiding, they achieve the impossible, they take the city. But the key to the breakthrough is actually in an encounter that Joshua, Israel's leader, has before the battle. And it's this part of the story that I want us to unpack today. So let me read the passage to you. This is Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Amen. This encounter is where the battle was won. It's the game before the game, as it were. So what can we learn from Joshua and how God dealt with him that might help us unlock how God wants to empower us to overcome the Jericho in our lives. Three simple things. Number one, look up. We read this in verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Now, to fully appreciate this verse, it's helpful to read it in the original Hebrew. The Hebrew really stresses the point. It says that Joshua lifted up Yissa, his eyes, and he looked Yah, and he beheld Hinna. The word behold or beheld is used nearly 1,400 times in the Bible. It means to open the eyes physically, but also to open the eyes of our heart. So we get the notion here that Joshua looks up physically, he really pays attention and he opens his heart to see spiritually as well. And what does Joshua see? A man with a drawn sword in his hand who later says he is the commander of the army of the Lord. Who was he? An angel? Or maybe a visible manifestation of Yahweh, God himself? Or is it the pre-incarnate Christ? appearing 
to Joshua, what theologians call a Christophany? I don't know, but it's fascinating that when Joshua asks him if he is for him or for his enemies, he answers, neither. He says, I've not come to take sides, but to take over. In other words, the more important question was really, whose side are you on, Joshua? God's or your own? It's also a question for us. And I suggest we want to be on God's side. Please understand this. If we're going to overcome the impossible Jericho challenges in our lives, then we must see where God is in it, what his plan is, and join in. So my key question for us today is this, what prevents you from looking up? What prevents you from looking up, from truly looking up with your eyes and your heart? Is it hurry? Our lives can be so packed and busy that we stop having those moments of stillness with Jesus. The busier our lives are externally, the more we need stillness internally. That peace that the Spirit of God brings so that we can perceive all that he is doing. As Dallas Willard said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life to see all that God is and all that he wants to do. Or maybe it's technology that stops you looking up. You know, our, our phones are a blessing in our lives, but thanks to our phones, we have become the head down generation. I remember a few years ago, I was in the US in the city of uh, Washington, DC, and uh, the streets were crowded. And uh, I was walking along with my head down. And um, because I had my head down, I turned and bumped straight into the man that had been next to me for a while by mistake. And I, I bumped into him and said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he replied, no problem. And I looked up. And to my amazement, it was the Hollywood actor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'd been walking along all this time right next to Arnie, but I hadn't realized because my head was down. <laughs> it's a bit like today. Jesus, not Schwarzenegger, but Jesus is walking with you. But sometimes because of our head down, we forget that the Prince of Peace is right there. You know, in the morning or in the evening, we can so easily spend our time just scrolling rather than looking to Jesus. What's the first thing that we look at in the morning? Is it this? Or is it this? You know, this is a window to the world, but this is a window to the one who made the world. Or perhaps we don't look up due to a lack of prayer in our lives. Please, I'm not condemning any of us, but might I suggest that we are too busy not to pray. The busier we are, the more we need prayer. A.J. Gordon put it this way. He said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you have prayed. And this leads on to the next question. What helps you look up? Prayer, yes. Reading the Bible, yes. Maybe playing worship music in the background or in your car. Maybe going for a walk with the Lord on your own. Christian community, perhaps. Your connect group. Find your place. Find your time. Find your spiritual rhythm. Whatever it takes. Maybe it means getting up. 30 minutes earlier in the morning or going to bed 30 minutes earlier in the evening, whatever it takes. Because when we look up, we will see a whole new world of possibility and gain insight into how the Lord will work in our lives and bring the walls of Jericho down. Look up. Secondly, fall down. Verse 14 says this, Then Joshua 
fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Joshua falls on his face in an act of worship and surrender. And these two things are so important, worship and surrender. This act by Joshua sort of reminds me of how in John's gospel, when the Roman soldiers arrive in the garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, when they see him, they fall to the ground under the weight of his glory and sovereignty. You know, when you meet Jesus in the scriptures, in prayer, in solitude, in Christian community, it's natural to fall down in worship. And look at the immediate impact this has on Joshua. His question changes from, hey, are you here to help me? To, oh, what message does my Lord have for his servant? In other words, what must I do to serve you, Lord? We don't ask Jesus to join in with us and to bless our plans like we're the boss. Rather, we join in with him and with his plans as we trust that they are the best possible plans. And this paradigm shift makes a massive difference. For example, it changes how we pray from help me to help yourself to me. Lord, use me. I am your servant. And the plan God shared with Joshua was an unusual one. Don't be surprised if God's plans seem unusual at times. He tells the Israelites to walk around the city of Jericho with the ark and the trumpets once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day to walk around seven times. And then when the priests blow the trumpets to shout, and they do this and the walls come crashing down and they run in to take the city. The Lord does indeed sometimes work in surprising ways. You know, after 190 years of the gospel, not gaining that much traction in Thailand, the Lord is doing something remarkable in that country right now. And it's through the surprising combination of an actress and influencer and a motorcycle car mechanic. This uh, actress earlier uh, this year, she's got a massive uh, social media following. She tragically died in uh, an accident. And most people didn't realize she was a Christian, so she had a Christian funeral that was live streamed and then posted on the Facebook pages of many churches and something extraordinary has happened. About half the entire population of Thailand have now watched that funeral. And churches all around the country have recorded an increase in attendance, people turning up just saying, I watched the funeral, how do I follow this Jesus? And then the other surprising thing has come through Pastor Samsa. This is the motorcycle mechanic who has no theological formal education, but he started planting churches in the villages, at first of Pechaban province and then beyond at an alarming rate. You know, last December, they saw 309 people come to faith in a single day. And in January this year, in an outdoor service, they baptized 520 new Christians. And this strange plan of the Lord is even impacting lives outside of Thailand. I heard this year uh, a woman's story. She's called Duan. She lives in Penang and she works for the Thai royal family there. And she watched the funeral service of this actress and influencer and thought, this is amazing. And as a result of that, found her way onto an alpha course at Wesley Methodist Church there in Penang. And then she came to faith and she's now been baptized. You know, God uses the most extraordinary things to bring about his plans and purposes. Will we surrender to Jesus? Will we surrender to the Lord and follow the plan that he has for our lives? He has a plan for you. But the key thing is this, before the walls of Jericho could fall down, Joshua had to fall down. Will we do the same? So look up, fall down, and then thirdly, take off. Take off your sandals. Verse 15, 
the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua was Moses' successor leading the Israelites. And I think it's interesting that this command he receives is exactly the same thing that God had said to Moses when he called him through the burning bush. In other words, take off your shoes when you enter my presence, says the Lord. You know, it makes me think that God really likes Asian culture because we take off our shoes, right, when we enter someone's place, when we go into their home. You know, when I'm, when I'm in the West now, and I'm inside and I see people walking around inside the home with their shoes on. Inside, I am freaking out. Internally, I'm silently screaming, going, oh, cannot, seeing people walking around carrying the dirt on their shoes. But the larger point here is this, it's the priority of holiness. The shoes were just symbolic. We cannot bring the dirt of our sin into God's presence. You know, if we're going to see major breakthrough in our lives, then it will be when we are living barefoot. By that, I mean with God, walking with God in his presence, with his spirit living within us. The spirit grows the fruit of the spirit in us and gives us the desire to live holy lives. And remember, and I want you to hear this, right now, you are are holy in Christ because of him, not because of our own goodness. That is why Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, taking our sins, taking our dirt on himself so that we can now stand in him holy, clean, barefoot, as it were, before God the Father. So how might you live? How might you walk barefoot in life? How can you be barefoot, holy in the workplace? How can you be barefoot in your home with your family? How can you walk barefoot in your school or college? Walk with Jesus. You carry his very presence by the Holy Spirit in you. I asked, at the start of my talk, what's your Jericho? I gave the example, is it a healing Jericho that you face? I heard recently from the Alpha Hong Kong team of uh, a guy called Tommy who had a massive cardiac arrest. This wasn't because of unclean living, it was a congenital condition that he and many, many members of his family have. Actually, many members of his family had died from massive cardiac arrests, and he had the same just recently. He ended up in hospital, uh, in a coma, on life support. The doctors said to his wife, look, there's nothing we can do. He's not going to wake up or recover. So please take a few days, but when you're ready, uh, we'll turn off the life support. That night, his wife prayed to Jesus. She said, Lord, I don't understand, but I'm asking you, will you heal him? And then she said, <laughs> I find this prayer quite funny because it wasn't, I will serve you. She actually prayed, Lord, if you heal him, I'll make sure that he serves you for the rest of his life. Well, the next day, the phone goes and she picks up the phone and it's a nurse from the hospital. And the nurse says to her, oh, your, your husband would like to talk to you on the phone now. And she said, oh, I think you've rung the, one, the wrong woman. My husband can't talk to me. He's in a coma on life support. And the nurse said, no, he's not. He's right next to me right now. And she hands the phone. And he says, oh, uh, hi, darling. Could you come and pick me up from the hospital? I'm ready to come home. She's like, what? So she dashes over there. And sure enough, he's sitting there absolutely fine. And she says to the doctors, what's happened? And the doctor said, we don't know. He suddenly woke up out of the coma and he's fine. And what's more, we scanned his heart. There is no sign of any cardiac arrest. They said, we've never seen this. And they used these words. They said, it is a miracle. Now, this couple 
uh, went to their local Catholic church uh, and they, they told the priest and the priest told the Vatican and the Vatican sent a team over to Hong Kong. You know, in the Vatican, there's a whole library, a whole vault full of documented, recorded, miraculous healings by Jesus. And as we speak right now, they are getting all of the, uh, the scans and the testimonies from the doctors. This is going in that vault as a documented miracle by Jesus. Whatever the Jericho that you face in your life, know that God is bigger and he is able. Let me pray for you right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody watching this. Thank you that you love them and that you are with them right now by your Holy Spirit. And we pray, come, Holy Spirit. We invite you into our hearts to make us clean, barefoot before our Heavenly Father. We turn from all that is wrong in our lives and we thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross, that we can be in right relationship with our Holy God. And we pray for the Jerichos in our life right now. We ask for breakthrough. Help us to see where you are in it, Jesus, to understand your plan, however unusual that might be. And as we worship and surrender to you, would you bring the walls crashing down? And if you want a healing miracle right now, if it's a health Jericho for you or a loved one, I just command the sickness to go in Jesus' name. I command the illness, the injury to be healed in Jesus' name. And those who are sick, receive your healing now in the mighty name of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that our greatest healing is the fact that one day we all will be resurrected and made perfect in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.